Good afternoon. Welcome to the Working Tools Podcast. Today we are talking about Masons in the Military on a special show for Veterans Day. Ladies and gentlemen, brethren all, welcome to the Working Tools Podcast, a casual conversation around Freemasonry. First, it's important to note that our opinions and thoughts are our own and do not reflect those of our Grand Lodge or respective craft or concordant bodies. Please connect with us and ask questions, either here on YouTube or on our Facebook page. We'd also appreciate a thumbs up and especially any comments on our videos. Welcome back. My name is David Colbeth. I'm a Master Mason in Washington State. I'm joined today by Matt Apple, who is also a Master Mason in Washington State, and Steve Chung, who is a Master Mason in British Columbia. Our special guest today is Colonel Retired, Jonathan Davenport. John, do we mind if we call us JD or John, or what do you prefer? On the JD's show? fine. JD's fine. Excellent. Well, JD, thanks for joining us today on this special show for Masons the Military. This will release on Sunday evening on the 10th and so the next day will be Veterans Day so we wanted to do a special thank you show to our military and our veterans and especially to those Masons that are uh, military act duty retired that kind of thing so uh, I know that uh, Matt I know you were in the service as well weren't you I was I was in the Navy excellent I, I was in the <laughs> Army and uh, neither of us retired. We didn't have the tenure that JD has, and so we'll we'll get into that. But uh, and we were going to try to get a Canadian uh, military man on here, and we weren't able to coordinate that in a sh short notice. But uh, we will definitely get somebody on. I think we're going to do another show in the future on the Masonic connections in the military. <coughs> so again, today we're joined by uh, JD Colonel Retired Jonathan Davenport. He's got an extensive history in the military and. Uh, in and if everything goes right, we don't, he doesn't make us too upset. Probably about three weeks. I guess it's actually 30 days from today. Uh, he exactly. will be the master of our lodge and King Solomon in Auburn. Uh, so our worthy, almost worthy, because he's not officially elected until next week, worthy brother <laughs> will be master. So, uh, John, do you want to talk a little bit about, you know, I know we could talk for hours and hours, but a little bit about your Masonic background. And, and the stuff that you can tell us that would go global. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, I mean, I came up in a family of largely Masonically impacted cultures, let's call them. And then <clears throat> from the LDS church, uh, Boy Scouts, and then the army, I think one of the things that has stuck with me forever, uh, especially when I was a DMLA in high school, um, was reading all the oaths and seeing how similar they were. And then, of course, unofficially comparing them, uh, knowing that, you know, Baden, Lord Baden-Powell was a Mason and knowing that all the guys that started the LDS Church were Masons. And <clears throat> there was a time, since we're talking about Veterans Day, which was Armistice Day, in World War I, we didn't get involved for the first few years. The U.S. didn't. But when we did, uh, in the U.S. Army, there was no one who was even basically allowed to serve on a divisional staff who was not a Mason. Huh. It was a, a, not necessarily a prerequisite, but it was it, all of them were started <clears throat> in that vein. And it was the first time that military lodges were ever created to where you could have a lodge that was overseas. It wasn't from your hometown. And that was a hotly debated uh, item at the time as well. It's still talked about in the military and in military lodges today. Um, those guys, <clears throat> when they got home after World War I, a lot of the Grand Lodges actually made them go back and prove up again um, and go through the steps again before they would be allowed to come sit in the meetings at home. Interesting. Interesting. I, I was watching a, a video program on uh, the United Grand Lodge of England, and they were talking about their different lodges. And, of course, there's thousands of lodges in England. Uh, many of them are regional based, kind of like most of ours are in the United States and Canada, most, mostly regional, but they have a lot of what we call, might we call affinity lodges. 
that are, you know, all the policemen and all the plumbers and all the electricians and all the military guys. They were talking about one military lodge in particular that has mostly military guys, many of them active. Uh, and it's kind of, they really enjoy that aspect of it because they, some they're currently serving with and some that they've served with in the past and guys that are retired or, or act inactive. Uh, it's, it's kind of a nice thing. Yeah, I actually did a security assessment decades ago for the um, NATO Lodge, which was odd to me. But uh, it's the only place I've ever seen <clears throat> when I went in where I saw the Bible and the Torah and the Quran all on the altar at the same time. Ah. Well, that's a whole nother debate on Facebook right now. <laughs> If you guys are following that at all. Uh, I haven't seen that one. We have uh, uh, the Quran on our altar every now and then. Depends when that brother shows up. Mm -hmm. And people go, what's that extra book on the altar? Yeah. It's I think it was the Grand Lodge of uh, the Grand Master Nevada. of Co Nevada or Colorado. Was it was Nevada. Nevada. Yeah, I made an edict. And I, yeah, in reading some of that, I wonder if he did it on purpose to force the decision that same thing that we've been going through with our grand lodge. And so anyway, that's, that's a yeah. whole nother show or two or three. Yeah. <laughs> I found a uh, looking up for armistice. One of the things about the history of world war one, knowing that where this came from and last year being the, you know, a hundred years was that <clears throat> the year before all of the conflict started, the grand master of the grand lodge of England had actually gone to Germany <clears throat> and was, received well and went to all the their different uh i think their annual communication and was actually installed as an honorary grand master of the lodges of germany huh. in 1913 I'll be done. that changed very shortly thereafter but <laughs> interesting to see uh the other thing i learned uh, when i was researching part of that for a class for the war college <clears throat> was that the guys in Wisconsin, which were the largest German population in the U S at the time, mm -hmm. um, and largely Lutheran, <clears throat> they went over and be above and beyond all of the requests that were made. So the, the bond came out for the red cross. They contributed like a half million dollars extra. The draft numbers came out. They contributed like 25% extra people. They, I mean, they went out of their way to demonstrate that they were supporting the United States period. <clears throat> it was very interesting to see the, um, I don't know what you would call it, but the lodges themselves uh, even stopped speaking German. There were probably within the five, six state area there in the Midwest, there were probably a hundred lodges that, that lodge was conducted in German. Oh, you know, wow. the rights were given in German and everything. And huh. then that, uh, they decided, nope, okay, we're not going to do that. They wanted no appearance of being even potentially uh, traitorous, if you will, during that, uh, for us, Eastern front of you know, the World War I issue. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. My, my family hails from that area and I know we have a, a German Bible and my, my uh, grandma is Lutheran as if by magic. Huh. <laughs> Weird. So tell us, yeah, I know you weren't a Mason while you were in the military, but you said you experienced quite a bit of that uh, and you kind of knew, so how, how did that work? <laughs> since you did have a DMLA background and you have family that's Masonic and you knew about all that, but you weren't actually there in Mason, you hadn't taken steps. How did that work for you while you were in the military? Well, even up, well, it's kind of a weird why, but the, but the how, <clears throat> so even up in, into college, after I had joined the service, I was in for a couple of years, I was still doing flower ceremonies like up in Green Lake in Seattle because it was nearby. I went to the university of Washington. Um, but I got involved with another. Woof, I got involved with another organization that uh, did not oh, yeah. allow me to have any affiliations. So I <laughs> had to maintain that for about thirty years, uh -huh. uh, and then once I retired, and then retired, uh -huh. <laughs> um, I could. And uh, and basically, the, the you heard from me uh, through Jim Fletcher. Basically, the moment that that happened. Yeah. Well, I I was kind of segueing into that. <clears throat> Uh, inability to affiliate uh, mm -hmm. situation in your your military background. I know you probably can't talk a whole lot about a lot of things, but can you talk? What can you talk about that? Um, what I can say is, well, on the army side, on the uniform side of things, it was not a problem. I knew people in lodges all over the world. They half of them, you know, once we got together and talked a little bit, they're like, "All right, well, you can do everything but sit in lodge." 
So I've, I've been around Masons in the military for 35, almost 36 years, I guess now. <clears throat> and uh, a lot of my friends were Prince Hall brothers, um, a big presence in the army. And uh, I had two first sergeants, two sergeants major, and at least three platoon sergeants in my officer career that were Prince Hall Masons that I worked with for extended periods on six continents. Interesting. So, well, I know we could explain a little bit about Prince Hall. I know you have kind of a neat story about how that all is. Can you explain for our audience what Prince Hall is? Um, so when, um, when masonry in the United States first came up and the two jurisdictions, especially for Scottish Rite, were being established, uh, there was a <clears throat> division, especially with regard to slavery, but in the Caribbean specifically, that didn't really exist. And so <clears throat> those um, folks promulgated because there were free blacks all over the, the South and East Coast of the United States at that time as well. And it, they really... Uh, developed in parallel, if you will, uh, especially in the southern jurisdiction. And because of the segregation issues, there were a lot of times where the Masons themselves would segregate themselves knowing that it was just going to cause both sides of the equation social problems if they did not. And it wasn't that they didn't deal with each other, and it wasn't that they didn't deal well with each other. They just couldn't do it on the main street. They could, they could do it in their lodges, but they couldn't do it on main street. Uh, and so that recognition, I mean, it goes back to the 1860s, which most people wouldn't believe anyone who's not a Mason would probably go, really? No way. You guys wouldn't, wouldn't do that. Well, actually, yeah, there were lodges of white brothers in other States that we were less likely to recognize for their policy and political positions than there were Prince Hall brothers that we would, wouldn't recognize. So, yeah. So, yeah, Prince Hall Masonry actually dates back to the 1770s. Oh, yeah. It was actually the first uh, first Prince Hall the Military Lodge was chartered by a a military lodge from, I want to say England, but maybe England. England. It was One England. The, so, yeah, it's been, it's there's a military connection there even. But, yeah, it's yep. been since late, 17, late 1700s. My family has some direct interaction with every phase of that. Steve, you're going to un unmute, bud. So is the uh, is your experience with all the Masons in the military kind of one of the reasons that drove you to ask the question? Um, I would have anyway, uh, because of my past and my family. And as soon as the opportunity arose, I would have anyway. But I can definitely say it didn't turn me off to it. I mean, there was there was there were no negative interactions uh, in my experience. <clears throat> you know, there are in any walk of life and in any organization there's just going to be somebody you don't necessarily get along with but i can say that of the masons that i interacted with over the years in the military there was not one that i didn't get along with for us it's steve that we don't get along with <laughs> <laughs> i'll be cutting that out uh, <laughs> Hey, Matt, did, uh, I, I was only in the military for a little while, and I didn't know anything about masonry during my tenure. Uh, I shouldn't call it tenure because it wasn't. <laughs> uh, w w did you have any interaction or did you know about masonry while you were in the service? Not really. Um, I had been minimally exposed to it as a kid. I, I, I had gotten a, actually when I was in junior ROTC, I got a medal from the National Sojourners. And oh, wow. I, I remember nice. leaning over to my parents at the award ceremony and saying, who are the Masons? <clears throat> and my parents going, they don't like Catholics. And that was about all I knew until, <laughs> until after I got a, gosh, until after I, I met my wife's father, who was a Mason. So it was, that was all for years. And yeah, it was, uh, I was in the Navy for eight years and I had no Masonic interaction that entire time. So. That's cool. That's cool. Well, again, we do want to say thank you to all the veterans that are out there in general and also to Masons, especially that are, that are military or have military background. Uh, and in our particular case, of course, it, it's men only in the fraternity, but we also understand that there's women involved in the military. and We thank them for their service. And so... Um, Again, this, this is kind of a special show for that and kind of an injured, you know, a break from our regular programming that we've been doing and talk about masonry and about all the working tools and about concepts and ideas and Grand Lodge and that kind of stuff. It's really focused about masons. And so, John, if you if you wanted, if there's something that I know you have a long, extensive career and long, extensive history, if, if you want to say thank you to 
someone or to the organization or is there, what, what would you say if you could say thank you to the military? What would you, what would you do? You know? Um, I would say that the organizations that reached out and gave me a chance along the way that were more meritocracy uh, based and within the army, a lot of times that just doesn't seem to be the case uh, because it's so big and unwieldy, <clears throat> but most of the relationships that you form. And for me, after 30 years of service, it became a by name basis. I mean, you get to the point where you get a job because somebody says, Hey, I know this guy who knows how to do that. And you get a phone call at two in the morning. And next thing you know, you're on a ship. Um, army guys don't belong on ships. So. Amen. <laughs> uh, right. So, uh, for me, it was, I think very early on, uh, again, another Mason, uh, who kind of picked me out of a crowd to go be a long range shooter for a couple of missions. And once, uh, they got more of a personal bona fides with me. It became, okay, we have somebody else is another, another tool in the toolkit, another person we can call that we know will go do this thing and get it done. And we don't have to worry about it. Um, <clears throat> and I think what, <laughs> there are a couple of interesting uh, organizations that I've been involved with between the joint special operations command when it first stood up uh, special operations command itself down in Florida. And then, five of the different special ops commands that are geographically based. And the awkward thing in the military is in order to stick around for very long, you have to go do some assignments you might not necessarily want to. I was lucky in that those guys would reach out to me and say, Hey, I know you need a company level command. There's a cool one over here. We think you'd be a great fit. Why don't you go do that? So instead of having to go do one that sucked, I got to go do something fun. So, you know, and there, there's a lot to that. Now, I probably wouldn't have stuck around 30 years if I'd have had crappy jobs every two to three years. You know, I, I actually got to go do something fun almost all but two. Yeah, two. There was, I remember one very specific occasion where a general officer came to me and he said, Hey, um, I think I need you to go do this thing and you're not going to like it. I said, wait, what? <laughs> so, well, you've never really had a job that was purely for the good of the organization. It's whoa, whoa. That sounds like you're going to give me a job that sucks. He says, yeah, kind of, but I know you can do it. I'm like, well, thanks. I could do a lot of things that suck. I know how to push a broom, but come on, man. Really? <clears throat> anyway. Um, take, take one for the team. Right. And that's okay. You know, at, at that point I was like, well, he's probably right. I probably haven't had one like that, but it was the individuals. It was the people. And there was, I can definitely say that along that path, there were at least a dozen that I know were Masons and who knew that I could not be one at that moment, but that I would later and we had those, I had those discussions. Unfortunately, a lot of them are older than me and half of them are dead, but um, it was definitely a good experience for me to be able to see them in their military environment. And then now I get to see kind of what they were doing while I wasn't around and go, oh, so they were also doing some stuff they probably didn't want it to, but <laughs> sometimes you're going to take one for the team. So how long ago did you retire? Uh, it'll be six years into this month. Okay, so that's still relatively recent service in my eyes. Uh, something that, you know, our viewers may or may not, you know, think about is, you know, when you speak to some people about veterans and, and uh, the service, you know, all they really talk about is the war, right? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, from what I can, uh, before, I, before I disconnected myself to news sources, mm -hmm. from what I gather, you know, the, the, the war in protecting the, our country are, is an ongoing thing. And so, you know, there's much more that, that our military has done for us over the years than fight two wars. And maybe you can enlighten our listeners as to, you know, what else, they, what other good things they've done to help protect our, our uh, rights and privileges? Well, okay. Um, first of all, I kind of was a both sides of the aisle guy for – home defense and for international activity. And the short version is that there is a military support to civil authority liaison in every state in the country. <clears throat> uh, some of them are grouped together. 
but you support FEMA, the FBI, the Secret Service. Um, I did security for the Olympics back in 2002 down in Salt Lake City. Um, the Nike Games in Portland, uh, Olympics in 96 in Atlanta, disaster mitigation exchanges with China and Vietnam and Thailand and the Philippines. And I think what you'll find is that those relationships are probably the most important thing. Um, that international relationship where it's the ambassador, a military member, and, you know, a, a politico of some kind becomes a international team, a relations team for the president and the Congress to have that external barrier. But then we also went inside. I was in the ninth ward in New Orleans after Katrina. Uh, we went into some torn up places in Oklahoma for uh, tornadoes. Uh, we put Tyvek around houses in Wyoming and Montana for the wildfires. You know, um, some of the biggest fires we ever fought, in fact, were right here in Washington State and were the longest ongoing efforts. Uh, just in Washington State alone, we trucked water to Kelso and Longview for six months because during one of the floods, their uh, two reservoirs, the freshwater reservoir and the sewage reservoir, were completely flooded over and commingled. So they had no you know, no clean water for six months. And so there's a lot of stuff that uniform members do at home that people don't really see. Right. Mm -hmm. Like humanitarian stuff that mm -hmm. you know, until, until it's publicized, nobody knows. Right. <clears throat> yeah, absolutely. Well, remembrance and thank yous and all that are very important on this upcoming holiday. And so uh, we would certainly ask that whether you are in the military or you know someone that's military, there's almost certainly someone that you know or have seen on the street, whether they're wearing a hat or a jacket or uh, have an emblem on their truck or whatever. Uh, we'd ask that you go up and shake their hand and say thank you for your service and uh, just take a minute to think about them, the men and women that are serving all over the world. And many times we do that in our prayers at the end of our meetings and whatnot. And so we would extend that from our show, from the Working Tools podcast, to all the veterans and military personnel around the world. Thank you for your service.